Welcome back to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, where experts discuss and share best practices to manage the convergence of the wired, the tired, and technology. I'm your host, Ira Wolf. Really excited about today's topic. One of the issues that uh, is certainly prevalent in, in conversation from in boardrooms, in restaurants, in uh, public places, wherever you seem to go, is generational gaps. And one of the things that, one of the tools, not one of the things, but one of the tools that I've used for several years, in fact, I used it in prior business about 30 years ago, but when I started this business, Success Performance Solutions, uh, it was the mainstay of the business uh, in 1995. I've been using DISC, D-I-S-C, as a tool to help people communicate, become better leaders, improve customer service, sales, team building, a whole host of things. So really excited today for those who are familiar with it, maybe a bit of a refresher. Uh, for those who are not or are new to it or haven't heard about it before, this should be a great podcast. Uh, but I'm really, really excited about bringing back a guest of mine and a colleague and a friend and a, another consultant who we met through the DISC uh, network, through uh, one of the, DISC, the test publishers. Her name is Jennifer Zemecki, and welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you, Ira. It's great to be here. So, so you and I have connected, uh, I don't know, too many years to talk about. <laughs> uh, but, but you've been using DISC for a long time. Um, so we know we can fill up uh, hours and hours of this, but we're going to try to keep this focused. So what I'd like to do is, is just so everybody's clear with what DISC means. Not necessarily, we're not going to go into all the details, but uh, some kind of overviews. And I'll give, you know, I'm going to present m what my overview is uh, when people say, well, what is DISC? And then, you know, I know you have some insights as well because you do this, you work with the tool routinely. So, um, again, I said DISC, what it represents is uh, D stands for direct or dominant, uh, I stands for I or influential, S is steady, and C is compliant or conscientious. And there's other variations of that. Uh, many of people say, well, I didn't take DISC, but I took one that had colors and each, each style was represented by a different color. Um, there's animals, there's different names that are associated with it. But all in all, it goes back to uh, William Moulton Marston uh, and even Carl Jung that recognized, uh, it actually goes back centuries uh, to Hippocrates when he recognized that there were four different styles of people. Um, I've, everybody gets hung up on what the letters mean, what does D mean again, what are those four letters. So I think it in terms of, of energy. And people who are energized by solving problems, they like to jump in, they like to tinker, they like to fix things, um, they're impatient, uh, tend to be what we call Ds. Okay? Um, I's tend to be energized by people. And if you notice, there's, here's the four Ps. Um, the D's are energized by solving problems. The I's are energized by influencing people. Um, they like talking to people. They like interacting with people. They like persuading. They like inspiring um, people. doesn't mean they're good at it, and that's a, 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 an important thing about this. <laughs> is, is just because you're a D doesn't mean you're a good problem solver, and just because you're an I doesn't mean you're, a, you're good at at people management or at influencing. It just means you're energized by it. S is energized by a steady pace. It's probably the most, in, this, in my mind, and, and Jennifer, you can chime in then, uh, in my mind, it's one of the most understood styles because uh, often people will say a high, if you're an S, you tend to not like change, you resist change. And that's not entirely true. They may not be the first to accept change uh, or embrace change. They may accept it, but they don't embrace it because they want to know what the consequences are. They're, they're sort of the methodical people that ask the questions, what, what happens? They're good to have on your side, but their first reaction may be to ask questions, and that high D who's impatient and just wants to fix it looks at them and says, whoa, 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 why are you always, you know, got your feet in the mud? Why are you always holding back? So, but S's are energized by a steady pace. That's the third P. And the fourth P is procedures. There are certain people that are energized by complying with rules and procedures set by other people. They like, they tend to get a good feeling 
when they dot the I's, cross the T's, uh, they get their taxes done on time, they meet the deadlines, they're on budget. It doesn't mean they like it. It doesn't mean they're good at doing it, but they just have this good feeling about it. So the four P's that I talk about um, are problems, people, pace, and procedure, and it tends to help uh, people, especially in, in managers, understand how it relates to business. Now, I did a lot of talking there. Um, Jennifer, I, I know you have similar views, but you may have some additional concepts and tips for people. Yes, that's an excellent way, though, to get to the core of the model. And we, when you speak of energy, think of it as their natural style. You know, when we say DISC, what are we meaning? We're meaning the behaviors of the person, and that's how they're going to go about their life. Not only how they're going to go about walking, talking, driving, uh, you know, their extracurricular activities, their work, it's how they do their life is what we refer to when we mean DISC. And the energy that you spoke to is easy to spot. So another tip when you're trying to figure out somebody's style, along with the four Ps, which is an easy way to remember it, is just look at their energy. Is their energy going outward? meaning are they the first one to say hello? Are they the first one to put out their hand? Are they the first one to welcome you? If so, chances are, you know, I would, you know, say it's 90% true that they are then extroverted. Extroverted meaning the energy goes out. That is the D's and the I's are extroverted. The introverted are the ones who tend to keep their energy within. So they gather their energy from being alone and they lose their energy from being with people, which is the opposite for the extroverts who gain their energy from being with people and lose their energy when they spend too much time alone. So therefore, you can quickly assess someone's energy. If it's outward, it's a D or an I. If it's inward, they're waiting for someone to say hello. They're waiting to be invited into the group. That is probably more of an S or a C. And the second way to spot somebody and get it down to their core style, and remember, you know, the population is not just a core D, core I, core S, core C. They're a combination of all four. And they have to have some high above the energy line and some low. So we're right now just speaking of what is their core style and how do you spot them. So again, you look at energy, as Ira mentioned, but then also once you go beyond energy, look at their focus. Is it on task or people? So if it's on task, those are going to be the ones who want to solve problems, Ds, and the ones who want to follow procedures, Cs. So Ds and Cs are task-focused. And the people-focused people are easy to spot the I's because, remember, they're the people people. And the S's are more the steady or the, uh, the patient people that prefer a steady pace. Um, they're really the good team players. They're the good support system. So, but they're still people-oriented over task-oriented. No, absolutely, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that when I describe how do we get to four styles, well, DISC is really two different scales, and uh, depending on what how you want to align them, but I think you and I both use a similar alignment, is that you have a kind of four quadrants, so you have a vertical, gra a, a vertical bar and you have a horizontal bar. Well, what happens is that the people that lie on the top half and the top two kind of quadrants there tend to be task oriented or people oriented. Now, what I tend to do is when I'm diagramming that, and I know we're on a podcast, so there's no visual there, but uh, when we, when we, when I'm, when I'm in front of people and doing a training or explaining this to some clients, I say, when you leave this office or you leave the meeting or leave the seminar, the first thing to do is ask listen and ask other people, how do they ask those questions? And if someone says, how was the meeting? And you or the other person, let, let's say you ask, how was the meeting? And they respond, oh, it was great. We started at 2.01. We had a break, learned about A, B, and C. They provide us a handout, and it's all task-oriented. You really don't know if they enjoyed it. You don't know who was there, you don't even know who the speaker was, but they, they basically talk, discuss the agenda, 
the time plan, and so forth. But if somebody says, and you ask them, how was it, and they respond in a particular way of, oh, it was great. I saw Jennifer there. We had so much fun. <laughs> and they had cookies for lunch, and then they brought out sodas. And, boy, we just had a blast. And they put these letters on our, our name tags, and we did this exercise. And somebody says, well, what I wanted to know was, what did you learn? And then they still go, they still don't address what they learned. They talk about the experience. So people talk about the experience. Uh, Task-oriented people talk about things involved with the experience. There would be no difference if you ask somebody about a picnic. Say, how was the picnic? People-oriented people will describe who was there, the activities that they did, if it was fun or not. The task-oriented people are going to decide, we had a baseball game, we only had eight players, we had to do this, we had to do that, we, you know, and they'll give you a, a, a they'll, they'll literally explain who brought what dish. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you, now, some people love that. If, if you're, if you happen to be task-oriented, you, that resonates with you because that's the answer you were expecting. But you know how annoying it is when you ask a question in a particular way and the person hears what you ask, but they respond in a different way than the way you expected. You also briefly mentioned about um, is it kind of primary and adapted. And that's certainly a question that I get all the time is, well, can't people change? Do you, do you care to address that a little bit, Jennifer? Yes, well, in the tools that we use, there's two graphs, and we recommend using a DISC tool that has two graphs, not three, because the third graph is simply an average, and, well, we're not really into averages. We want to have accurate data. So if we're using two graphs, the second graph is telling us the natural style, and that's how they would prefer to be. This is how they would like to go about it. This is their natural style. And it's, it's um, nature over nurture, meaning this is how they're hardwired when they come out. And come out meaning when, if you've ever had children, you know that from the day they're born, they have this imprint of their, of their style. And it may have nothing to do with your style at all. So people are born with their natural style. However, once we're in life, whether we're even in school, whether we're in the workplace, whether we're at home taking care of the children or the home, we have what's called a graph one, an adapted graph. And the adapted style is more fitting to the environment, more fitting to the, to the nurture, what's going on, how do you need to be in that environment. So can people change their style? Yes. I ride mass that all the time too. And I say the answer is predominantly no. Can they adapt their style for a job or for a certain period in their life? Say they're a mother, they're staying home with the children. Now they maybe they're really high Ds, but they need to be high Ss um, to be more patient, etc. Yes, they can adapt. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that it doesn't take energy, but they can adapt. But really, it's for a short period of time. It is not for a lifetime. It's not for the next 10 years. Um, but it does cause stress. And the more adaption that's required to the environment, whether it be work or home or in relationships, the more energy it will take. That's very helpful. And, and again, you and I think so much alike with this. And one of the examples I give, I describe, and, and again, we're, we're describing things and assuming people know what this, what this looks like. And in a sense, when we talk about graph one and graph two, there's four plot points, goes from zero to 100, and people fall on that. And above 50%, we indicate that, it's, that you'd be a high D, you're above 50% on the, on the I, you're a high I. Um, but you're also, uh, you can be 20%, which means you're low. Um, the other part of that, and you said this earlier, is that we're a mix of all of these. We have a dominant style, but the others affect it very much, how, how we play out. Um, but it is what happens is if you have this graph, and let's say someone is at, uh, let's say your score, and I use that as quote unquote score, is that you're a 70, uh, you're a 25 percent I, and you're a manager, and you're advised that you need to be out on the floor more, you need to walk around, you need to engage with your people, you ha need to have some meetings, you need to have more face to face. Well, for a low I their preferences, remember, low I means they're de-energized by influencing other people. If you're 
so we need to stop sending memos, stop say, sending text messages. Um, you need to actually go have a face-to-face -face meeting with that individual. So they have to take that 25% eye and pull it up, and it's like a rubber band. They need to pull it up to maybe 60, 65, 70% for five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be. Um, the challenge is some people are better equipped to hold that rubber band high for whatever time it takes, and then when they're ready to release it, it doesn't snap back. It's not, and, and, yeah, we see that a lot with, like, when we try to coach, and I'm sure you've been in this situation, I certainly have, you have a manager whose who's prior, who's preferred style is, is, is a D, and they're a 90% D, and they like to get things done now, and they have a short fuse, and they say things that they shouldn't, they think, they, they talk before they think, uh, and you coach them to be a little bit more patient, lower the D. Well, they do but they're pulling that D down and then all of a sudden they just reached their breaking point. Okay, had enough. I'm out of my comfort zone long enough. I want to go back home. And they let that go and you see all the anger come out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So yeah. you mentioned, but I, I think there's an important message that's in here. And I know we're, we're both, we, we talked just a few weeks ago on emotional intelligence and for anybody who's interested, they can go uh, up to the geek skeezers and googleization.com podcast. Uh, and we talked about emotional intelligence. When you were talking about uh, the primary versus the adapted or hardwiring versus how we feel we need to adapt, just because some, I recognize that I may need to, as, it, as we just talked about, shift that D or bring it up or down or change the I, um, that's one sense of that. That's a self-awareness. But how does emotional intelligence play into that? I mean, is that the same thing? I mean, is it is an adapted graph the same as emotional intelligence? No, and that's a big misunderstanding that's going on out there. Um, we have to remember that the DISC is a wonderful tool. Um, it's probably the most popular tool. Um, there's many reasons why. One, it's been around the longest. Uh, it's, most of them are very valid, validated, so they're very accurate. People love to use them, and we can talk about the application of them later. But we have to remember, DISC doesn't solve all the problems. DISC is simply a measurement of behavior, simply telling us how they're going to do it. But nowhere in the DISC does it refer to the emotional skills that are involved. And that's what we talk about when we talk about emotional intelligence. And the quick, you know, my quick definition of emotional intelligence is the ability to feel, understand, and manage your emotions and the emotions of others to build highly effective relationships. And nowhere in DISC is that ability, is it measured? What is measured in DISC, and, and this is where some people get thrown off too, there is a primary emotion attached with each of the four DISC styles. You mentioned it when you just were talking to with the D. With the D, the emotion that ex is expressed the most is anger. With I's, it's optimism. With S, they are actually often misunderstood because they are highly emotional, but they are non-demonstrative. So they're what we call the best poker players. You never know what they're mm -hmm. feeling or thinking because they're very stoic. Yeah. People think, oh, they don't care. They don't have any feelings. They're not expressing themselves. They're not getting upset or they're not getting excited. But they're just doing that all internally. And the extroverts have a hard time reading that. And the C's primary emotion is fear. Um, they're primarily driven by fear. So sometimes what I hear out there is people talking about disc and emotions and then bridging that into emotional intelligence. And they are two different things. So we have to remember, if you look at the EQ model, uh, what happens first is we have a thought. It's a cognition. Then we have a physical reaction to that emotion, okay, to that cognition. And that is not disc. This comes later. Next, we go to then through our skills, our competencies, and that's where EQ comes in. So EQ comes in before, in the chain of reaction, comes in before DISC. 
after EQ, it goes through our motivators. Why do we care about this? Okay? And finally, it comes out of us in our expression, whether it be anger, optimism, non-demonstrative, or fear, of how we react. So remember, though, when we're talking about emotions and disc, it's like the final reaction, but it wasn't what started the chain. EQ comes before DISC. And, and I know one of the first steps with emotional intelligence is self-awareness. I mean, that, with, without understanding who you are and, you know, especially how other people see you, the chances of you having a high EQ or EI is almost impossible. So DISC is a great first step. But as we talked about is how do you flex to all these other styles? Because wherever you are, there are people that are different with you, different that approach people and tasks different than you do. And then how do you close that gap? And that's where, as we were talking before, is, okay, I'm a low, I'm, I'm a natural low eye. I feel comfortable there, but I have to move out of the comfort zone. And where how I approach the EI is helping others understand is that if you have low EI, you, is coming out of your comfort zone for five minutes is a huge undertaking. If you can develop the composure and the control and the, and the management and you recognize other people's emotions, you become more comfortable with doing that because there's a reason and there's a purpose behind it. And you can stay in their zone out of your, your personal comfort zone a lot longer. But that's a big difference. Uh, you know, and I know when I first got into this and, and probably the same to you, people would just say, well, you need to coach the person to the other side. You need to coach the person um, from the primary to the adapted to be more effective. And unfortunately, they, they just discounted how prepared that individual was. When I started the program or this episode, I said, um, that you can use this for leadership and personal coaching and development and sales training and customer service and team building. It's used in a variety of things. Um, I, also, I also think that once companies do it, they go, oh, we did la this last year, let's do something else, and they miss that opportunity. So give, give us some examples of how you work with DISC with your clients. And I've been doing this, as, as you have, for a long, long time. And there's four primary ways that I apply the disc. A um, couple of them we've mentioned. Um, so I really like probably one of my favorite applications of disc where I really think that disc is served well, meaning it's used properly and it's not being misused, is in the world of team building. You know, how people communicate. And you did a great video recently, Ira, on the wheel. And that is primarily how I like to teach it as well, is when you're doing team building, and I'm a DIS and C, and we're doing all that, we put everybody up on the wheel, and we learn the kind of the do's and don'ts of how to communicate with which style, what are the strengths, what are the possible derailers, and we go all through that. And so team building is a wonderful way to use this correctly. Another way that we use it predominantly is in selection. But I'm saying that with some, uh, I'm going to say like with a warning sign. <laughs> the warning sign is um, please don't use DISC only in selection. And that has been a misuse of DISC. You know, 25 years ago when some of these other tools like EI and motivators were not yet developed, we did use DISC only in selection. And I knew back then that there was something missing because there would be mistakes. We thought we were hiring the right style, and it didn't work out. Well, now, 20-plus years later, I realize why, and that's because DISC is only one measurement. You also need to be looking at the, of the values or the motivators of the person. You need to be looking at, at in cases, um, you know, competency. You need to be looking at their, maybe even their processing. You need to be looking at their personal skills. Um, all of those other factors need to be wrapped up in the selection process. So use DISC and selection as long as you're using other measurements as well. And don't use DISC just as the end all in selection. Um, the third way that I like to use it is in coaching. And, you know, I built a business on doing business and executive coaching using um, DISC and other tools. 
We also use it in sports. We also use it in students. Um, some interesting work in relationships. Um, what we have found with marriages is that if people are getting divorced in the first seven years, usually it has to do with a difference in their disc style. Um, and people who may be getting divorced between 7 and 14 years, they haven't learned to complement each other's different disc style. And so there is also problems there, um, meaning they just, they're just not adapting or understanding the differences. Um, and when we see divorces after a long period of time, you know, 14, 15 plus years, it's usually a difference of values. It's not usually a DISC um, problem. So DISC can be used in all areas of life, not just business, but personal relationship. Students can use it. Um, we, we have uh, assessments targeted towards middle school, high school, and college um, that is based on DISC and some other tools. And probably the final way that I've used DISC quite successfully over the years is in conflict resolution. And we call that a triad, where we may have a boss, we may have a subordinate, they're not clicking, they are not on the same page, they have different styles. Well, usually we find out that, among other things, there's usually a difference in, in DISC in their behaviors. Um, also, we do that a lot with executive teams and where there's just two peers, there's two, you know, VPs that aren't getting along. Okay, well, we go in, we do some work with DISC and some other tools, and the conflict subsides. So those are my four primary ways. Do you have any other ways that you're using it, Ira? Well, sure. We've used them for customer service and sales. Similar reasoning is that we find out where people are. Um, so, you know, most salespeople stereotypically happen to be energized by influencing other people. We hope they are. Um, and they happen to be these because they are energized by not only solving problems, but they like to kind of break down the doors and fix things and get things done and get results. But the challenge with that is there's another 60% of the population that they don't represent. So in order to sell to the people on the other side of the disc wheel, which is uh, different populations, they have to change their messaging, they have to change their approach, they have to change what they need, they have to change the conversation. So oftentimes I'll, I'll talk about DISC as four languages, and you know, it's English, Spanish, Japanese, and Russian. I can speak louder and yell louder and, and talk slower, hoping that someone who doesn't understand English understands me, but it doesn't help. So <laughs> if I, if I want to jump the line and as a D, I want, which I am, if I want to communicate with an S, I have to learn a little bit about what S is about. I have to slow down a little bit. I have to talk. I have to not be pushy. I have to allow them time to think. I have to give them assurances. I have to tell them who else I, you know, who else like them I worked with to make them comfortable. But if I think that my approach is the best way and it's worked with some people, and so therefore it should work with all, it doesn't work. Same thing with customer service. So ultimately, we didn't talk about this and we can talk about so many things. Ultimately, uh, you can't, you don't have to, ha your customers and, and um, clients and, you know, hopefully you're, you do this with your employees, but basically strangers on the street don't have to take a dis disc assessment to learn what they are. By understanding DISC, you can, it's called the observable language because you can observe the body language and each style has a different body language. Um, they have a different tone and pace of their speech and they actually use different words so, or prefer to use different words. People could fake that out, but once they get good at it, but when people go back to their primary hard wiring, it's pretty typical. So I know we're almost out of time, Jennifer. We can talk forever. I'd love to have you back. We can talk more, and, and if anyone has any questions that they want to direct to us, um, you, you'll be able to contact either one of us, and we'll talk about it at a future event. Jennifer, if someone's interested, especially what was interesting, I didn't realize you did all that with students, uh, how can they get in touch with you? Yes, the best way is to go to well, W-E-L-L-R-U-N.com. So the company name is Wellrun Concepts, 
And that's the best way to find us on the web. And you can go there, check out all the different tools we have. Go into the store is where you will find some of these sports assessments I'm talking about, the student ones. We have one on parenting. Um, we have one on life values. Um, and they're disc-based as well as other, uh, other measurements that we use. So thank you so much, Ira. Well, that's fantastic, and uh, hope everyone enjoyed it today. Um, love to have you back again, Jennifer. Thanks for joining us for another discussion about DISC and another episode of Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization. Stay tuned. Uh, come back to our website and podcast. Subscribe to it on iTunes, and watch for our next episode. Have a great day, everyone. For anyone interested in more information about DISC, emotional intelligence, or other pre-employment or leadership assessment tools, please call us at 1-800-803-4303. That's 800-803-4303. Or visit our website at www.successperformancesolutions.com. That's successperformancesolutions.com.